after the resignation of Russian President Boris Yeltsin on December 31, 1999. Vladimir Putin, whom Yeltsin named his successor, became the acting head of state until the elections in March 2000. Thanks to tough and decisive actions in the North Caucasus, as well as unlimited administrative resources and support from Russian oligarchs, Yeltsin's successor managed to win the first round of the presidential election, with 53% of the vote. The reign of Vladimir Putin began with a full-scale struggle against disloyal oligarchs and the media, which in a very possible way criticized the actions of President Putin. Pressure on the media caused discontent among the liberal opposition, which called the decision of the Russian president dictatorial and anti-democratic. And what awaits Russia in the coming years, and whether Vladimir Putin will be able to win the presidential elections in 2004? We will find out right now. And before we start, I would like to say thank you to everyone who liked this video and subscribed to my channel. Well, now let's begin. Returning to domestic politics and the Russian Federation. After election as president of the country, Vladimir Putin began to strengthen the power of the federal center in the regions of the country, in order to have greater control of the regional authorities. In May 2000, Vladimir Putin established the institution of plenipotentiary representatives in the federal districts. Large-scale work has begun to bring regional laws into conformity with federal ones. This, in turn, significantly reduced the autonomy of such regions of the country as Tatarstan, Bashkiria and Chechnya. Another major reform in the country's constitutional and political system was the change of the procedure for forming the Federation Council, carried out in August 2000, as a result of which governors and heads of legislative power of the regions were replaced by representatives personally appointed by the president of the country. As for the economic situation in Russia, after the 1998 crisis, the government of Vladimir Putin needed to act decisively in order to save the country's economy from collapse and ensure stable economic growth for Russia. In the 2000s, Putin signed a number of laws that introduced changes to tax legislation. In 2001, a flat income tax scale was established for individuals. The income tax rate was reduced to 24%. A regressive scale of the unified social tax was introduced. Turnover taxes and sales tax were abolished. The the total number of taxes was reduced by 3.6 times, which in turn had a positive impact on the development of small and medium-sized businesses in the country. The system of taxation of the raw materials sector was also radically changed. The mechanism of export duties was reconfigured, and a mineral extraction tax was introduced, which made it possible to increase the share of oil and gas rent. The measures taken by Putin's government led to a gradual stabilization of the Russian economy and an increase in the country's income. Against the backdrop of an improving economic situation in the country, President Putin's rating increased significantly, which in turn played an important role, since parliamentary elections will be held in Russia in 2003, in which the ruling party intended to gain an absolute majority. Of great importance for the political realization of the majority in parliament was the unification in December 2001 of the previously competent political organization unity and fatherland all Russia into the new political party United Russia, which significantly strengthened the position of the Putin government in the state Duma. Regarding the country's foreign policy, President Putin made it clear in his interviews that he is ready for close cooperation with Western countries, however, noting that Russia has a negative attitude towards NATO expansion to the east. In June 2000, by decree of President Putin, the concept of foreign policy of the Russian Federation was approved. According to this document, the main goals of the country's foreign policy are to ensure reliable security of the country, influence global processes in order to form a stable, fair and democratic world order, create favorable external conditions for the progressive development of Russia, form a belt of a good neighborliness along the perimeter of Russian borders, search for agreement and coincident interests with foreign countries, an interstate association.
actions in the process of solving problems determined by the national priorities of Russia, protecting the rights and interests of the Russian citizens and compatriots abroad, promoting a positive perception of the Russian Federation in the world. The event that to determine the sharp rapprochement between Russia and the West was the terrorist attacks of September 11. Then Russia, without hesitation, took the side of the United States. The culmination of this rapprochement was Russia's participation in the anti-terrorist coalition created by the United States to prepare and wage war against the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, and the signing of so-called Rome Declaration Russian aid relations. In accordance with that, the Russian NATO Council was created on May 28, 2002. The common enemy, represented by radical Islamist groups that actively supported the forces of the Chechen separatists, greatly influenced their rapprochement between Russia and the United States. To support the operation in Afghanistan, the United States created an air base in Kyrgyzstan and began using the Uzbekistan airfields. Russia, in turn, provided its airspace for the transit of military cargo in US and NATO military personnel to Afghanistan. In addition, the Russian authorities held a summit in Tashkent with the leaders of Central Asian countries, at which the heads of state of the region signed several agreements aimed at strengthening security cooperation, within the framework of which Russia sent about a thousand of military specialists, who must strengthen the armed forces of the states in the fight against terrorism. The increase in the military contingent of Russian troops in the region made it possible to strengthen the borders of the countries of Central Asia and significantly reduce terrorist activity in the region, while at the same time strengthening the Kremlin's influence on these countries. An unstable political situation was observed not only in Central Asia, but also in Transcaucasia. In Georgia, dissatisfied with the rule of President Eduard Shevardnadze, leaders of opposition parties call on the people of the country to take to the streets. The main and most general prerequisite for the revolution was dissatisfaction with the governance of the country by Eduard Shevardnadze, who took office after Georgia gained independence. The indignation of the population was caused by accumulated claims against the government related to the difficult economic situation in the country and corruption among government officials. The situation was complicated by the desire of ethnic minorities for independence or annexation to the Russian Federation, which was expressed into the fact to independent existence of Abkhazia, South Ossetia and to a large extent Adjaria. Negative emotions in society were also caused by Shevardnadze's refusal to attempt to forcefully resolve the conflicts in Abkhazia and Ossetia, combined with unsuccessful attempts to resolve the issue peacefully. Opposition protests reached their peak on November 20. Second, the day of the meeting of the Georgian parliament, the legitimacy of which was called into question. On the same day, oppositionists led by Mikhail Saakashvili with roses in their hands seized the parliament building, interrupted Shavinadze, who was given a speech, and forced him to leave the hall, accompanied by bodyguards. The president declared a state of emergency in the country and called for help from troops and police in the area of his residence in Belisi. However, a large part of the armed forces and police refused to support the current president, and went further to the side of the opposition, forcing Shavernadze and his supporters to leave the capital region. The Russian authorities very closely monitored the events taking place in Georgia, since the removal of President Shavernadze would mean a significant weakening of Moscow's position in the region, since the new government, represented by the pro-Western opposition, openly announced its intentions to close all Russian bases in the country. In addition, Opposition leaders stated that the new government would resolve the issue with the breakaway regions of Abkhazia and South Ossetia using any methods available to them, including military invasion. Anti-Russian rhetoric and direct threats to security and stability in the region forced the Kremlin to intervene in the Georgian crisis. On November 23, 2001, a plane carrying the Georgian president, accompanied by the Russian aviation, arrived in Moscow. Vladimir Putin held a diplomatic meeting with President Shavinadze in the Kremlin, at which the Russian president promised his Georgian counterpart all possible support for the sake of maintaining stability in Georgia, as well as friendly relations between the two states. In fact, this meant Moscow's direct intervention in the Georgian internal political crisis on 
the side of the current government. On November 25th, troops loyal to the current Georgian government for the first time entered into armed confrontation with opposition forces, which in fact meant the beginning of the civil war in Georgia. In the evening of the same day, Eduard Shervinadze spoke on the radio, calling on opposition leaders to lay down their arms and sit down at the negotiating table in order to prevent bloodshed. But the opposition ignored the president's calls for a ceasefire and peace talks. Although the course of the week there were fierce battles between pro-government forces and those supporting the opposition, in which opposition troops tried to break through enemy defenses and occupy the city of Akhaltseke, the only major city that was under the control of the government of Eduard Shevardnadze. And although in the first days of the clashes the opposition troops failed to achieve serious success, most of the country was under the control of anti-government forces, and therefore a large number of warehouses with weapons and ammunition. In addition, as was said earlier, about 70% of the Georgian armed forces went over to the side of the opposition. Of course, troops loyal to the current president were able to hold the defense and even carry out small offensive operations. But all this could last about several months, after which, without sufficient ammunition, government troops will no longer be able to hold back the onslaught of the enemy, who has significant numbers of troops and strategic advantage. In order to improve the material and technical situation of government forces, the Russian leadership sent several helicopters with infantry weapons, ammunition and food to Georgia, which, although insignificant, still improved the position of government forces. The relative calm accompanied by only minor clashes was interrupted on December 1st, then opposition forces launched a full-scale offensive against government positions using attack aircraft. Thanks to air superiority, anti-government forces managed to take a serious breakthrough. However, during the air raids, a Russian military base located in southwestern Georgia was bombed. As a result of the strike, several soldiers of the Russian Federation Army were killed, which was the reason for a full-fledged armed intervention in the Georgian Civil War. And although the Georgian opposition apologized, explaining to the world community that the strike on the Russian military base was wrong, the Russian leadership intended to use the death of Russian soldiers as a reason for military intervention. In the weeks following the tragedy at the Russian military base, Kremlin-controlled media outlets waged a campaign to demonize Georgian anti-government forces. All this was necessary in order to motivate Russian society to support armed intervention in the Georgian conflict. In addition, President Eduard Shevardnadze officially requested support from the Russian government in restoring constitutional order in Georgia, legitimizing the entry of the Russian troops in the eyes of the world community. In order for President Putin to use the armed forces on the territory of another state, he needed to obtain permission from the Federal Council. And since, after an aggressive information campaign to discredit the Georgian opposition, the people of Russia demanded revenge for the killed Russian soldiers, the Federation Council satisfied the appeal of President Vladimir Putin regarding the introduction of the armed forces into the territory of Georgia. Western countries reacted to this in different ways. Eastern European countries, such as Poland and the Baltic countries, spoke sharply negatively about Moscow's military intervention and the internal conflict in Georgia, while Western European countries and the United States did not react to this decision from the Kremlin, as they didn't want to spoil recently improved relations. Moreover, from the point of view of international law, Russia had every right to send troops into the territory of Georgia. Since the current president of Georgia got permission for this, and therefore relations with the West remained at the same level as before Russian intervention into the internal affairs of the neighboring state. Early in the morning, December 2, 2001, the 10th Guards Tank Division under the command of Colonel Alexander Denisov, which was previously located on the territory of Georgia, received an order to assist in the offensive actions of the Georgian armed forces, which actually meant the beginning of Russia's armed intervention in the civil war in Georgia. To coordinate the Russian troops, General Alexander Lapin arrived in Georgia on the military helicopter, and with him a cargo with several dozen Strela two-man depths, designed to destroy low-flying air targets such as airplanes or helicopters. On the evening of December 2nd, Russian troops, together with Georgian government troops, began an assault on Batumi, which lasted only a few hours, since there were no regular units of anti-government forces in the city and resistance to Russian troops was provided only by disorganized militia, consisting of local police and civilian. 
In addition, the fall of the capture of the city was accelerated by the fact that the 145 Motorized Rifle Division, located at the military base in the suburbs of Batumi, assisted in the assault on the city. After government troops gained a foothold in the city and its surroundings, Colonel Denisov's tanks division began advancing north, soon reaching the outskirts of the city of Zagdidi, the assault on which began in the early morning of December 3rd. This time, resistance the government troops was provided by a regiment of the National Guard, armed not only with small arms but also with samples of Soviet man portable anti aircraft missile systems, RPG 7, Ukrainian Skiff anti tank missile systems, and Soviet artillery guns. Because of this, the assault on the small town lasted for several days. The city fell on December 5th. During the assault, the Russian army lost the PT 76 tank, as well as two units of BMD 2 arms armored vehicles. Fortunately, casualties among personnel were avoided. Only a few soldiers were injured during the assault of the city. By the end of the day, the 10th Panzer Division reached the border with Abkhazia, after which the command was faced with a serious choice to continue the offensive in the north, in difficult mountainous terrain, in order to press opposition troops to the Russian border and with the support of border forces, destroy enemy army, or stop advance to the north and launch an offensive offensive towards the Georgian capital. The experience of two Chechen wars showed that fighting in mountainous areas without developed infrastructure is fraught with high casualties and losses in equipment. Moreover, there was also a danger that the war in the northern regions of Georgia could turn into a guerrilla war and drag on for many months. And therefore, General Lapin, together with the Georgian general staff, decided to begin a breakthrough to the east. On December 9th, Denis of the division entered into battle with the mechanized brigade near the city of Kodaisi. After 12 hours of fierce fighting in the vicinity of the city, the enemy was forced to retreat and hastily organized the defense of the city. During the three-day assault, the enemy troops managed to destroy one Russian T-90 tank and two self-propelled officers, two S-19. But despite this, the Russian army managed to oust the enemy from the populated area and occupy the city, thereby dividing the group of anti-government forces in two, blocking several enemy formations in mountainous areas, from where the enemy tried to get out. But an approaching armored brigade of government troops repelled the enemy attack. After the capture of Kudaisi, Russian troops moved further to the east and, without encountering any resistance, came close to Tbilisi. Once again, the Russian command faced a dilemma. They immediately take part in the assault of the Georgian capital or to continue the offensive to the east in order to capture the eastern part of the country, thereby completely encircling the capital. After much deliberation, it was decided to continue the the offensive in the east, since in the event of complete encirclement of Tbilisi, the enemy forces located in the city would not be able to rotate forces, which would greatly facilitate the assault on the large city. On December 16th, Denisov's tank division again entered into battle with an enemy mechanized brigade. The detachment of anti-government forces, weakened by the battles, was not able to provide organized resistance, and therefore the battles for the city lasted little more than a day, after which the enemy brigade was forced to leave the settlement, retreating to the hilly terrain near the Azerbaijani border, intending to redeploy to the mountainous regions in the northeast of the country, and from there conduct combat operations in every possible way interfering with the advance of government forces on the capital. However, Colonel Denisov gave the order to launch an offensive to the north in order to get ahead of the enemy brigade and block it in the hilly terrain, where the remnants of anti-government forces in the east of the country were easily defeated by the superior forces of the Russian army. After this, the entire eastern part of the country came under the control of the administration of President Shavinadze, and the Georgian capital found itself completely surrounded. On the night of December 24, the Georgian army, together with the 10th Tank Division, took part in the assault of the city. Only one brigade of the National Guard offered resistance to the government army, and therefore the assault assault on the city did not last long. On December 28th, after four days of assault, the Georgian government army entered the government quarter of Tbilisi, where the remnants of the opposition government were located. After most of the leaders of the Georgian opposition were arrested, the remnants of the anti-government forces laid down 
the arms and surrendered. The civil war in Georgia, which lasted just over a month, ended with the victory of the government of Edward Shevardnadze. Thanks to direct military intervention by the Russian Federation, the incumbent president managed to retain power. However, the fighting caused serious damage to the infrastructure and economy of the country, and therefore, the Georgian leadership had no choice but to request economic and humanitarian assistance from Russia, which actually made Georgia a puppet state. Thanks to decisive actions on the part of the Kremlin, Georgia, where Protestant sentiments were strong, found itself completely dependent on its northern neighbor, which significantly increased Moscow's influence in the region. In addition to increasing the Russian military contingent, the Georgian authorities applied to join the CSTO, from which Georgia left in 1999. The victory in Georgia greatly increased the ratings of President Putin and the ruling party, which will play into the hands of the next parliamentary and presidential elections in Russia, allowing United Russia to form a majority in the state Duma and Vladimir Putin to be re-elected for a second term. And we will find out what awaits Russia in the future in the next video. Like and subscribe to the channel for more interesting Hoi 4 videos. Have a nice day, see you soon guys.